16, and going through verse 16, Paul lists eight things about the Jews that allows the Thessalonians to know that they are in company, or there's abundant company, in suffering that they were enduring. There's plenty of others who have suffered. He talks about the Jews having killed the Lord Jesus. They killed the prophets. Uh, they um, persecuted us, he says. Uh, probably Paul, Silas, and Timothy there. They pleased not God. They were contrary to all men. The sixth thing that we were talking about in verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Uh, and this, to a certain extent, explains what he means by uh, the previous statement that they were contrary to all men. Um, the Jews as a whole oppose the Gentiles, but especially the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. When Peter did that, uh, they and Peter comes back to Jerusalem, he's immediately met by Jews who were questioning him as to why he would go into the Gentiles. Uh, Paul, when he was arrested, asked uh, Lysias, the chief captain, if he could speak to the people, and he gives him permission. He begins speaking. He goes through his conversion and everything until he says the word Gentiles, that God had sent him to the Gentiles. And when he said that, there was another commotion, and they said that he was not worthy to live. He should be put to death. Bill? A proselyte? Is that what you're thinking about? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, uh, the Jewish religion did allow proselytes, but they became Jews uh, and had all the rights and privileges of the Jews. Uh, Gentile men who, had, who became proselytes had to be circumcised. That was one of the requirements. Uh, so, so they did have that provision, but to go to a, a Gentiles to preach the gospel to them, that was just too much. These were not proselytes, and so, okay, John. Proselyte. Right. Uh, <coughs> And so they had tried to forbid, to stop or hinder the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. That's true. The uh, Lord told Paul, leave Jerusalem. They won't accept you. Um, and that's where he says he sent me to the Gentiles, and that's, oh no, can't have that. Um, so they were forbidding them to speak to the Gentiles. Mentioned uh, last week the word speak. Uh, it is a Greek word, leleo, or from leleo. Uh, there's another word that is also we would think them pretty much the same, say and speak. 
say it generally translated from the Greek word lego, two different words. Lego, say, deals more with the substance of what is said. Leleo, as here, deals with the very utterance of the words. You are not even to utter words to the Gentiles. It's kind of the idea in which he is setting forth. Um, if you look at Ephesians 5.19, we talk about this in regards to instrumental music. And when it says, speaking to yourselves, in Psalms and spiritual song, speaking is this same word, or from the same word, Leleo, as translated speak here. It's dealing with the utterance of the, of the words. Uh, we, if you wanted to expand on that, it's the enunciation, the pronunciation, how you say the words. It's not as so much dealing with the substance, which is Lego. Um, and then if you turn over to John 12, 48 through 50, there's almost what uh, we might think is a repetition, just uh, the same word. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth them the words that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. When he says that what I should say and what I should speak, say is that Greek word lego, speak is that Greek word leleo, that deals with the actual pronunciation and the saying of the words, while say deals with the substance. In other words, the substance came from God, or the Father, and the words themselves came from the Father. When we deal with it in singing, in Ephesians 5.19, it is the saying of words put to melody. That's what singing is all about. But in that singing, it is the saying of words, speaking to yourself. Psalms and spiritual songs. Um, so just... A little bit of the inter uh, interesting aspect about this word, forbidding us to speak to other sounds, to say words to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Um, now that the Jews tried to do that, did they accomplish their purpose? No, they didn't. He went ahead and preached anyway to them. Uh, but they at least did everything within their power to try and prevent it. Notice also that these words that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were going to be speaking to the Gentiles is that which would save the Gentiles. The Gentiles, or those that were saved, were not saved because of some Calvinistic predestination where God determined before the world began, I'm going to save this individual and this individual and this individual. They were going to be saved by what Paul spoke to them, which would be the gospel. Um, nor were they saved by a direct action of the Holy Spirit coming upon them to save them. Now, that's what 
denominationalism is steeped in, and thus some feeling that I have because I feel that the Holy Spirit has come upon me and he saved me. And thus I feel this. Uh, that's not what was going to save them. It was the words that were going to be spoken. And they thus had to be taught for taught the gospel for their salvation. Turn over to Romans, the uh, 10th chapter. And starting in verse 13, <clears throat> Paul writes, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, let me just stop there for a minute, just for emphasis sake. And I'll ask it as a question. I'm not asking for a response. How do we call upon the name of the Lord? It is not by simply saying, Lord, Lord. Because Jesus says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So it cannot be simply by an audible expression of Lord. Uh, or a recognition that Jesus is Lord. If you recall, on the road to Damascus, as Jesus is speaking to uh, Saul at that time, and initially he asked, Who art thou, Lord? Didn't know who he was, but knew he was a, a great being. And Jesus says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And he says, what wilt thou have me to do, Lord? He now knows who he is and recognizes that Jesus is Lord, and yet he knew also that he was not yet saved. So. He's told how to call upon the name of the Lord, though, later on by Ananias, when Ananias comes to him in Acts 22 and verse 17, or 16, uh, Why tarest thou rise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord? That's how you call upon the name of the Lord. If you want another phrase, um, in Acts 2 and verse 21, it has a repetition of this phrase, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter preaches the gospel to them. They, in verse 37, what shall we do? Because they were pricked in their hearts. What shall we do? Why didn't Peter say, well, you idiots, I've already told you what to do. Call upon the name of the Lord. That's what you do. Yeah, but what do we do? Call upon the name of the Lord. That's what you do. And if you wanted to really emphasize that to somebody, you just keep going back and forth uh, four or five times until they're sick of it. But that's exactly what the nominational world would say. Just call on the name of the Lord. How? By just audibly calling his name. And that's what they were asking. What shall we do? And what did he tell them, though? Verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's how you're going to be saved, by calling on the name of the Lord. What is calling upon the name of the Lord? It's obedience to the gospel. Now then, come back to Romans 10. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall we call in him in whom they have not believed? There's necessity for faith or belief. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And so belief comes by hearing, and he's going to state that, state that in a few verses later. They have to be taught is what it is. Um, so how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except it be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. 
Notice this now, this statement though. But they have not all, what? Obeyed the gospel. What is calling on the name of the Lord? It is the same thing as obeying the gospel. That's what it is. And thus, when in Acts 2, Peter tells them to repent and be baptized, he's telling them to obey the gospel. And if you wanted to go into a study then, we won't but uh, at this time, but uh, what is the gospel? Well, Peter, or Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, specifically verses 3 and verse 4, says that it is the d death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we obey a form of that doctrine, Romans 6 and verse 17 and 18, in the act of baptism, Romans 6, verse 3 and verse 4. So he's telling them on the day of Pentecost, obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. That's what you have here. But Paul is saying they've not all obeyed the gospel. For as I said, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So these Gentiles, to be saved, had to be spoken to. They had to be taught that preacher being sent to them so that they could come to faith and obey the gospel and thus be saved. It wasn't going to be by direct action of God upon their hearts or the Holy Spirit upon their hearts. It wasn't going to be by just God's already determined who it is. It's going to be by them hearing that which Paul taught and then their obedience to the gospel. Uh, I will mention Matthew 28, 19, and 20. In that great commission, go, in all, uh, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The way in which disciples are going to be made. Now in Acts 11, Verse 26 says the disciples were called what? Christians, first at Antioch. So in order to become a Christian, what must one do? Well, he says there has to be teaching that's done. And then, because of that teaching, a baptizing and teaching them all things. The baptizing and teaching are actually what's referred to as modal participles. They explain how you make a disciple. You make a disciple by baptizing them and by teaching them. And that is teaching them all things that Jesus taught or commanded. And it's being baptized is literally it deals with being baptized into a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, you're going to be saved. In that saved relationship, you now have a relationship with the deity. Uh, so the Jews were trying to forbid this from taking place. Uh, It's hard to imagine anything more vile than what the Jews were doing. Going to try to forbid saving people. And yet that's the position that they had put themselves in. In Matthew 23, you go out and uh, search and try and seek and find one proselyte, and when you find one, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. That's what Jesus told them. Uh, so 
Yes, it would be similar to that. The seventh thing that Paul mentions in this list is they fill up their sins. Always. This is reminiscent of God's statement to Abraham about the Amorites specifically, but all of those in that land of Palestine. If you remember in Genesis 15 and verse 16, he says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, God was tolerating their sin and continuing to tolerate their sin, but there comes a point in which that toleration comes to an end. And he will not tolerate any anymore because their sin is full. Uh, they had rejected God. They had embraced wickedness and idolatry. Here, as far as the, what he's telling these Thessalonians, uh, they had persecuted, the, uh, the Jews had persecuted the prophets that God had sent to them, finally crucified God's Son. God had continued to permit them to exist, but you go so far in your wickedness that God's patience comes to an end. Remember 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to, you, to, long -suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants people to repent. He does not want people to be, to be lost. But their sin becomes so persistent and to such a great extent that finally his long-suffering nature ends and punishment comes. Um, to a certain extent, God is saying that no sin is omitted from the Jewish history of opposing God's plan. If you look at, here is the plan, the, the purpose of God. And you look at the Jews, they had opposed that purpose of God continually, in every way. And now then, Paul is saying, they're now even trying to prevent the saving gospel of Jesus Christ from being proclaimed to the Gentiles. Uh, in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and verses 31 and 32, Jesus says, and he's speaking to the Pharisees and scribes, who he's called hypocrites multiple times, Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Fill up the measure of your fathers. And that they opposed the prophets, they opposed God, killing them. And now then, he's saying, you're going to do the same. B.W. Johnson, in his commentary, wrote, To fill the measure of their sins so full that God would reject them as people. That's what he, they were doing. They were getting their sins so full and overflowing, if you will, that God has rejected them to, as a people. And if you notice the statement, that last word in this phrase, to fill up their sins, always. They did this at all times. You go back to, from their history to 
the time of Christ, continually opposing God's plan. And now then, even in Paul's time, they continue to reject God's plan and oppose it, to do everything that within their power to destroy God's plan. Uh, Raymond Kelsey, uh, in his commentary, summarized a controversy regarding this phrase, though. When he writes, uh, was Paul intending to indicate purpose or result? He says decision is difficult. Perhaps in Paul's thinking there is not always a great distinction between the two. The general teaching of the passage is not greatly affected, regardless of the route one takes. One could not, in fairness, insist absolutely upon either to the complete exclusion of the other. And as I was studying this, I mean, you, get, go, they, you see them going back and forth. Was it intent or purpose? Or the purpose or result? Those are the two terms that are generally used. Was the result that they filled up their sins always, or was that the intent or the, re the purpose of it? Um, doesn't really make that much difference as to the outcome of it, because the outcome's the same. Um, and so the eighth point, the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. To the uttermost literally is a phrase which would be translated unto the end. And as Vincent puts it, the meaning is that the divine wrath has reached the point where it passed into judgment. God's wrath is now coming upon them. In Matthew 23 and verse 28, we read verses 31 and 32, where Jesus telling them to fill, the, fill up the measure of your fathers. In verse 38 then, he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now he's talking specifically about the temple. The temple was God's house and was always referred to it as God's house. But now then Jesus changes and he's saying in effect, that temple, which is God's house, is no longer God's house. It's your house, but it's no longer God's. Why? Because they had filled up the measure of their fathers. Um, and so God was going to be coming in judgment against the Jewish nation and their religion to completely destroy it by the, Titus and the Roman armies. We're going to talk about 70 AD in a minute because from the time in which Paul writes this, within 20 years, the destruction came upon them. Um, the, it's interesting, is come upon them. Yet it's in the future, but it's, if you have that 
Greek tense, it's aorist tense, which in this case is being used for the certainty of the, of the destruction. This destruction is coming upon them, it's certain. Uh, Wilbur Fields, in his commentary, states, God's wrath against the Jews was particularly demonstrated at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Already at the, at the time when Paul wrote this epistle, the great rebellion of the Jews against the Romans was taking form. When the rebellion finally came in 66 AD, it led to a bloody war in which the walls, temple, and much of the rest of Jerusalem were demolished and burned down. 97,000 people were carried away captive into slavery. And 1,100,000, I don't know why I worded it that way, but 1,100,000 is 1,100,000. Why not just put it that way? But uh, 1,100,000 perished many by starvation and killing one another. Josephus, the historian, tells us about this in Wars of the Jews, and he gives a specific reference. But Paul was certainly correct when he said that wrath was come upon them to the uttermost. It was stated by Jesus that that would be a destruction that would be the worst destruction ever. Uh, people literally going into, well, starting to eat one another because of the starvation, eating their children. Uh, can you imagine a parent eating their children? Uh, out of hunger. Uh, the, the destruction that took place in 8070 was atrocious. Uh, the passions of that war, the hatred that had been brought up and fostered for several years of fighting, could not even be quelled by the Roman generals. Supposedly they tried to prevent some of the destruction taking place and they couldn't even accomplish it because the, the men were that filled with hatred and rage against the Jews. They, they just destroyed anything and everything that they could. And so, as Jesus stated in Matthew 23, there was not one stone left upon another of the temple. Now, that was, okay, if you look at the temple, the first temple was built by Solomon, destroyed by the Babylonians, rebuilt later on, destroyed again. Uh, it was then being rebuilt again. And if you remember when Jesus drove out the money changers and he said, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And what was the response of some of the people? Four years, six years, this temple has been under construction. Uh, okay. Forty and six years, this temple has been being built. This, that would be referred to and is referred to as uh, Herod's temple. Uh, so yes. <laughs> it was, it was taken away at the first one. Uh, and If you look at this one, the destruction of Herod's temple, not one stone left upon another. Uh, 
you know. I, Okay, they did do that, yes. Uh, but it was long gone. But uh, you know, I've gone to places and seen buildings that were destroyed. A few times I've seen buildings where you don't have much left upon another, uh, one thing upon another. Very seldom, though. This beautiful building that is being built by Herod 46 years and working on it and leveled to the ground where not one stone is left upon another. That is a destruction, a wrath to the uttermost as is Paul is saying here. And Paul is, I think, dealing with not final judgment here, but he is dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem because he's dealing with the Jews. These are the things that the Jews have done. And now then, they are going to suffer the consequences. They're going to have the wrath of God come upon them in that destruction of Jerusalem where you don't have one stone left upon another. It no, it wasn't a small building. <laughs> you would need some major, we would say heavy equipment, very heavy equipment to try and destroy it. I don't know about the pyramids. Uh, they were massive stones. These would have been massive stones as well that they would have been using. Um, but uh, just think, 1,100,000 Jews died. Now then, of all of those who died and were taken captive, not one Christian died in destruction of Jerusalem. Why? Jesus had warned them, when these things take place, flee the city. And told them even, pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. Why on the Sabbath? Gates would be closed and could not travel as a result. And women, yeah, should not be pregnant because of the difficulty of traveling then. Uh, basically, you had, uh, the Roman armies had to withdraw for a little short period of time. And when that withdrawal took place, immediately the Christians leave. And so not one died because they listened to the signs of the time, which was not today, but it was then. The signs of the times were times of when the Christians were to escape Jerusalem because it was going to be destroyed by Titus and the Roman armies. And people try to take those signs that Jesus gave for that and try and make it applicable to today as the end of the world's coming. Well, no. It could, might not. But those things don't apply to today or to the end of the world. They apply to the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. When... Uh, Christ comes in final judgment, uh, there will be no signs. It will just happen. 
won't be time to prepare at that time. So we have to be prepared already. Uh, and later on in this book, we'll see Paul dealing with Christians, what happens with Christians on that day. Now then, to make a distinction, Paul in 1 Thessalonians, when he deals with this, is not dealing with the ungodly. And so the premillennialist comes along and says, oh, it's going to be a rapture of of the righteous. Well, not in their sense, but is, and their teaching is that the ungodly or the unrighteous will be left behind. The only thing is, nobody will be left behind. He's just not dealing with non-Christians. He's only dealing with Christians. That's the only subject that he's dealing with in for and First Thessalonians. Now then, <clears throat> the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, I think foreshadows the final day of judgment uh, in that there is going to be a great destruction that takes place. Uh, that final day total destruction where this world will be destroyed, it will melt with fervent heat, will cease to exist. Uh, Second Peter, third chapter, describes that very well. Uh, and Okay. Uh, he does describe it very vividly. That, and thus asks the question, what manner of persons ought we to be? Because... Okay. Okay, it's going to be dissolved. That's what we said. It will melt with fervent heat. And so, what manner of persons ought we to be? Uh, that this world's going to be dis destroyed. We need to live in such a way that we're prepared for it. This world is not our home. We're just passing through, as the song says. First Corinthians 15. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. Uh, everybody that has already died will be raised, be given an incorruptible body, immortal body. Those who are wicked will be given an immortal body to go into an eternal torment. Those who are righteous will be given an immortal body to go and be with God. Okay, Dale. We don't know what kind of body we will have, but we will be have a raised, incorruptible body. So, for the next couple of weeks, Paul is going to be teaching, and I'll be out of commission. So, you've got Sunday too, don't you? <laughs> I think some uh, people are going to have to get together on this. Um, so, <laughs> I thought you were going to take Bible class on Sunday and Wednesday. <laughs> so, 